I am going to talk about data supported or data informed um, school improvement. And I have three topics that I would like to cover today. The first is a little bit of theory, a data use theory of action. Uh, secondly, I think it's very important that we're all, all aware of the enablers and barriers that exist when we want to support schools in the use of data. And uh, I understood that some of these enablers and barriers were already discussed uh, in some of the presentations this morning. I was very happy to hear about the possible collaboration uh, with universities and Fachhochschule. I think that is very uh, important and also the data systems that are in place. And thirdly, I am going to talk about how we can support schools in the use of data and I'm going to really go into an example of how we do that in the Netherlands and also in other countries. Um, but first, a, a little bit of theory, so bear with me please. So one of the things that we often see in the different countries I had the pleasure to work with, uh, and this is something I also see at the university that I work with, we have a problem and we immediately go to a solution. And I see a lot of people nodding, so I think this sounds familiar. So in schools, oh, we have a problem, our mathematics achievement is low, let's increase the number of hours of teaching, and let's buy uh, new books, new curriculum materials. Is this familiar? Raise your hand if this is recognizable. <laughs> Unfortunately, we see that a lot, but there's one big problem with this. This might work, but it also might not work because we do not know what the causes of the problem are. And this is why we need data, because we need to look into the data, what causes low mathematics achievement, and then we can take actions that really will help increase mathematics achievement. Imagine that the problem here is something to do with the quality of instruction in the classroom. Well, if the quality of instruction is low, an increased number of hours and new materials are not going to work. And that is why in the data use uh, theory of action that we usually use, we start with a purpose. So we do not start with data, we start with a purpose first, we start with the goals, then we collect data to what extent we are reaching our goals and why we are not reaching our goals if that is the case. And then we have to turn those data into information. So we do the analysis, we have to connect it to our own knowledge, to our own context, uh, as the previous speaker was also talking about. We need to contextualize this. Then it turns into knowledge that we can use and that hopefully will lead to improved outcomes for our students. So if we start with a purpose, uh, unfortunately, um, data use is very narrowly associated with accountability. Usually when I say that I do data use and then people say, oh, you're one of those accountability people. And I'm like, yes, I am, but I'm also school improvement because I think both are very important. But unfortunately, it's often associated with shaming and blaming. Oh, you're not doing well, you're not doing well. We'll point the fingers at the schools and the teachers and the students that are not doing well. In some countries, when there's too much accountability pressure, you also see that it leads to really short-term goals, only to achieve that what we are held accountable for. Also, narrow curricula. I don't know about here, I, I've heard uh, talk about PISA. Uh, in the Netherlands, we had another PISA shock. So now the focus is almost entirely on reading and mathematics, which are important, but there are more things important than just reading and mathematics. Also, when you talk about data use from an accountability perspective, usually the focus is very narrowly on student achievement, on assessment results. But these days, fortunately, we have a lot of data on the children in our schools, and we need to have a more holistic a picture of the children. So always when I talk about these three first bullets, it almost sounds like I'm against accountability, which I am not, because accountability is very important. Schools are accountable to our society, um, to our partners, to parents, to the children, so accountability is very important. And usually when we work with schools, uh, we start usually with an accountability perspective because those data that are often used in an accountability system, uh, data from external inspections, for example, can be a very nice starting point for a school improvement cycle. 
One of my favorite quotes you can read here uh, on screen, it's by Lorna Katz and Stephen Earle, and they say, accountability without improvement is empty rhetoric. So it doesn't work. If you only have accountability and no improvement, it does not work. But if you only have improvement and not accountability, it does not work either. So we actually need both. So we often use data uh, from external evaluation, from school inspection as a starting point, but then we talk about, okay, but what are our concrete and measurable goals? And especially when I work with teachers, I made the mistake once that I worked with schools and I said, well, let's make these nice data inventories. Let's see what kinds of data you have available. The teachers hated it. They told me, well, I became a teacher to work with children, not to work with data. So then I turned it around. So then we started having conversation like, what are your goals? What are the things that you're passionate about? What are you unhappy about? What are the problems that you're facing? And let's see how data can help you solve these problems. And then we started having entirely different conversations that actually helped. That also means that you need to talk about quality. And I really like the quality frameworks that you've been developing here, because that is very important as a starting point. What is quality? What is quality for the school leader? What is quality for the teacher team? What is quality for the teacher? So you have to define your purpose and you have to define your goals. And this can be anything, achievement, equity. Uh, I heard talk about inclusion this morning, but also well-being, safety and health. So in a school, you decide what the important goals are and then you compare how are we doing with regard to those goals and what is our desired situation. And this is sometimes rather complex. It sounds easy. But when we work with schools, parents sometimes have different ideas about feasible goals for their children than the teacher has. Teachers have other ideas about what feasible is than, for example, a school leader have. So the dialogue here is very important, that dialogue about the quality of education. What do you mean? What are our goals? And how can we make them measurable? And once we've done that, then we start collecting data because we need to collect data if we are reaching our goals and if not, why not? And data um, is simply defined as information that we collect in a systematic manner. And it can be anything from surveys to classroom observations to interviews to assessment data. But we do have to remember one thing. Uh, we often pretend that data are very objective. Like, these are the data, and the data hold the truth. But remember, any type of data is humanly constructed. When we talk about a survey, there is somebody that writes down the questions in the survey. When we talk about assessments, somebody develops the assessment items. So it's really important to acknowledge that and also look out for bias in the data. Because there's bias in human, but there might also be bias in data. And the famous saying is garbage in, garbage out. So low quality data often leads to low quality decision making. So if you start working with data in schools, check the quality of these data. Um, and also one of the things, our society is constantly evolving. When I was in primary school, for example, digital literacy was not an important goal in the curriculum. I was very happy with my cassette deck, that I could play my tapes, but I had no computers or anything. But I think in these days, information literacy, um, the implementation of AI, digital literacy is a very important goal, which also means that we have to think about how we can collect data on these important goals. And when I talk about data, it's not just numbers. It can be quantitative data, such as assessment and surveys, but classroom observations are also a very powerful form of data. Teachers collect all kinds of data, homework assignments, um, their talks with students. So there are a lot of different types of data that can be used in a quality care cycle. And it's important to look at these different types of data. Now, one of the sources of data that I would like to recommend, especially that we've been focusing on the last couple of years, is student voice data. So for example, interviews with students. When we say to teachers, you can interview your students, 
they sometimes react like, can we interview our students? Yes, you can, and mostly students will be very honest about why they did not uh, achieve in a certain subject. They will tell you, we've been gaming too much, we have not been studying, but they will also tell you, well, I did not understand the instruction, then I raised my hand and I asked for another explanation, and the teacher told it to me exactly like the first time. But I didn't understand it the first time, so I didn't understand it the second time either. So they're very honest, and they will give you a lot of good information that is helpful in the school improvement process. And now comes the most difficult thing, because we can collect the data, but we have to analyze the data, and we have to interpret the data. And this whole sense-making process is not very easy. It looks very straightforward here, but it is not. Because it's not exclusively rational. And people filter their data through their own lenses. Like on a scale from one to 10, one person might be very happy with a six, where another person might not be happy with a six. Just the same data, but it has different meaning to different people. And there's also the confirmation bias. We tend to cherry pick the data that already fits with our existing beliefs. So how do we make sure that we look at it uh, in different ways? And learning is influenced by many different factors, so it's sometimes really hard to make sense of the data that we have. But it's important that we see those data as a piece of feedback, as a piece of the puzzle. And here, the collective engagement and the dialogue and the teamwork, for example, in professional learning communities is very important because then you can confront each other's ideas and you can talk about why do you think a six is a sufficient and you don't think a six is a sufficient and you can engage in that sense-making process together. And then we get to the action phase. When I started working many years ago with schools on data use, I thought that the data analysis would be the most, most difficult step. I love data, I love doing the analysis, but like doing that with teachers, but it turned out that analysis is not the difficult part. The analysis is something that follows certain rules. Uh, it's something that you can teach. We do data analysis workshops uh, at our university, but then Determining what to do based on the data is very difficult because the data will not tell you exactly what to do. The data can tell you that your students have difficulties with percentages, but the data will not tell you if you simply need to reteach it, if you need to teach it in a different manner, if you need to use different materials. That's something that the data will not tell you. So here you need the expertise and the knowledge of the people in the schools as well, and you need to combine that here. And then if you do that, we have a lot of studies that show positive effects, uh, increased quality of schools, increased student achievement, so that is really nice. But if you don't do it uh, according to the steps that I just presented, there are also possible unintended effects. So what we see is abuse of the data, we see misuse of the data, um, for example, where you only focus on the students that are just below the benchmark, so you focus all of your attention on the students that are just below the benchmark to get them over that accountability benchmark, but you forget about the students that are below or above. So you see all kinds of possible unintended effects. Now what makes it even more complex is that I presented this as a very straightforward picture. And this picture looks a little bit like my six-year-old son cut hold of it. But this is actually what we found in our studies, because it's really complex. It's not so straightforward as ra and rational as I just um, presented. And what makes it even more difficult is that it influenced by the teachers in the school, the technology available, the context, and the school organization. And we found several enablers and barriers uh, that influence data use over the years. Well, first of all, we expect our teachers to use data, but that means if you want to make sense of the data and take actions based on the data, teachers have to have pedagogical content knowledge, a lot of knowledge on the curriculum, these days more and more tech technology skills because we have different systems that hold our data and you need to combine those different systems. Belief in the use of data, 
I can't tell you how many teachers I've met over the years that said things like, I've been a teacher for 20 years, I know my kids, I don't need data. So that's also something um, that we need to confront. Ownership over the data um, and student learning. Well, the achievement of those students are a little bit low, but they're from a socio-disadvantaged neighborhood, so it's not my fault, it's the fault of the children in the neighborhood. It's also something that we need to confront. And data literacy. To be able to do this, teachers need to have data literacy. However, um, I don't know about here, but in the Netherlands, that's not a big pro part of our teacher training program. It is in there, but we don't pay that much attention to it. And that we also see as a result that educators find it difficult to collect data, to analyze data, um, to make sense of it, and to transform it into action. They really need support. And we found the same results in many different countries. So we really need to invest in professional development and support for our teachers. Then technology. It is important, but I do have to say here that we've also been working with schools successfully where we literally had to go up, up in the attic to get the data out of the boxes because it was stored in boxes instead of in systems. That's changing, of course. Schools are, in, are investing in technology that makes it easier. Uh, but there's still some work to do here because there are different data systems that do not always talk to each other. So you have to connect the different systems. You have to make it very easy for school leaders and teachers to get it out of the system. Um, we see some instances where we are using artificial intelligence to even make the lives of our teachers hopefully easier, but that comes with a lot of uh, other risks, which I don't have the time to go into, although I would love to talk about it. Uh, but what is really important here, that technology is important, but we need to combine it with the human touch, because teachers and school leaders are ultimately the ones who have to use it. And there are more enablers and barriers. I'm not done yet, because the context also is very important. Policies, like the ones that we've been discussing here, also influence if data use goes easy or not so easy. And here, I like to call data use a little bit of a balancing act, because yes, you need accountability, but too much focus on pressure and accountability does not work. But too little focus on pressure and accountability does not work either. So how do you balance that? And I think what is very, very important is that we keep seeing data use as a tool and not a goal. Many years ago, uh, when I had a talk with our Ministry of Education, and somebody was saying, yes, data use, uh, at least 80% of the schools in the Netherlands have to use data. And then I asked, but why? What's the purpose? So data use is a tool and not a goal. Let's not forget that. It's a very important tool. And then finally, within the school organization, it really helps is there is already a structure for collaboration um, in there. And what I really liked in reading um, your quality framework is the focus on you have the school, you have the teams, and you have the teachers. So that emphasis on teamwork, I think, is really important. Uh, the collaboration is so important for data use. Also having a data use culture, so that collective responsibility. We are together responsible for the children in our school, and we are going to use data for continuous improvement. And we have a vision for why we think data use is important. But also, on the other hand, respect for teachers' autonomy. So give them the autonomy needed to actually make decisions based on data which requires facilitation and support from our school leaders, professional development opportunities, and leadership. And I could talk about leadership for data use the entire day, uh, which I'm not going to do, but I would like um, to show you something, and I think the slides will also be shared with you, but there's a QR code here. We developed a tool that schools can use to support data use and any other type of innovation. And this tool consists of all the indicators that we found in our research that are important if you want to make data use a success. 
and it's available in English, so you don't have to learn Dutch. <laughs> If you don't get it yet, um, it doesn't matter. We'll make sure that the slides will be shared. Because uh, the final part of my presentation, I want to get a little bit more practical. So we've covered the theory. We covered a lot of enablers and barriers. And I hope I didn't scare you, because all these enablers and barriers are things to take into consideration. But now I want to focus on, OK, how can we do this in schools? How can we make this very practical? And this is what we've done the last 15 years with uh, the data team intervention. And the data team intervention is an intervention where a coach, and this could be, for example, um, I think you have something like a quality care manager uh, working in schools, but somebody who works with schools on the eight steps that you see here on the screen. And I will go through all the eight steps systematically. And you go through the eight steps. It's more or less a quality care cycle or an empirical cycle. But what we've done is we made it very practical for schools. We work in teams, teachers and school leaders together. And we don't start with data, but we start with a goal. So what is the goal that you would like to work on in your team? And this can be low achievement or something to do with safety or well-being. The team decides on the goal they want to work on. And this intervention has two goals itself. The first is professional development in the use of data. Remember that I said that we had a problem with data literacy in our schools? This is a way to work on the data literacy of teachers and school leaders in the school, so that they learn how to use data to improve education. And another important goal is, of course, solving that specific educational problem that the team is working on. And we have a coach that takes them through the whole step. Now, you did not expect a little geography lesson today, but here it is. We've been doing this in five different countries. Do you recognize the countries? Just checking if you're still with me. You can shout out the countries if you recognize one. Netherlands. The United States. Sweden, yes. I heard France, but it's a neighbor country of France. Belgium, and one more. We are playing them tonight in uh, <laughs> England. So we start with, and here it comes again, we start with the goal. So we don't start with data, but we start with what is the educational problem that you would like to work on. And a data coach then always asks, proof that you have a problem. Because what we also find over the years is sometimes the problem that teachers or school leaders think they have is in reality a little bit different. So sometimes we've been working with schools that say, oh, we have a huge problem in the sixth grade of education with achievement in this subject. And then we looked at the achievement in that subject, and it turned out that the achievement in the seventh grade was much lower than in the sixth grade. So that's always the first step that we do with schools. And then they collect the data on that specific problem, and they also talk about the goal that they want to achieve. We always collect data of at least three years, uh, because we want to make sure that we found patterns in the data instead of, OK, we have one year uh, where there was a problem, and the next year it was already solved. And then we formulate a very concrete problem definition, as you can see here. So for example, 45% of our students is failing mathematics. The desired situation is next year, well, of course, we want 0%, but we have to be uh, realistic as well. So next year, maybe no more than 30%, and the year after, no more than 15%. Sounds very easy. Sometimes this has been an hours-long discussion to come up with that goal, because you have to come up with a shared goal. So different uh, examples of goals that we've been working on. In this case, I brought some examples from Sweden and the Netherlands. Often achievement, uh, examination results, but also stress, safety, these kinds of goals. So the teams decide the goals that they want to work on. Then the next step is the causes of the problem. So we found a problem. So what do you think causes the problem? 
We ask colleagues, because the data team is usually six to eight people in a school, but other colleagues might also have ideas. We often also look into the literature, maybe somebody's, something is already known about our problem, and then we make a list. Making this list is very easy. Teachers and school leaders have a lot of ideas on what causes the problem, but making it measurable is more difficult. Um, we have people from the ministry here. One of the causes we hear a lot, it's, it's because of our policies. And then we always ask, okay, what? What is it about the policies and make it measurable, prove it? And that's usually a little bit more of a challenge. But we do that and we support them uh, to formulate concrete and measurable hypotheses. And based on these hypotheses, we can collect data. And we try to make use of existing data as much as possible because schools have a lot of data available. So we don't go out collecting new data if possible, we make use of existing data, or if the data are not available, we make use of existing instruments. And as I said, this can be qualitative and quantitative. Sometimes we investigate hypotheses about the quality of instruction. For example, then they do classroom observations, or we use surveys, and you can see a lot of examples here on the screen. Here comes the garbage in, garbage out. Because it's really important to check the quality of the data. And this is something that we do. Now, I'm a researcher, so I work with Kohens Kappa, um, Krombach Alpha. Teachers and school leaders don't like these terms. What we've done is we made a checklist, just a common sense checklist. So how much data do we have available? Are there errors in the data? If it's a survey, how are the questions formulated? And teachers and school leaders are really good at determining the quality of uh, these data without fancy terms. So this is something that you do. And unfortunately, we've also found that this step is very important because over the years in all of the different countries, we found many different problems with the quality of the data. Validity problems with surveys. There are a lot of low quality surveys out there in schools, missing data, errors in the data, a dot or a comma in the data systems makes a difference, uh, or that we have data from only one year. So it's really important to check this before you do the data analysis. Um, this is something where we found out that teachers, but also school leaders needed a little bit of extra support. Uh, we don't do any sophisticated analysis. We work with schools, so we don't have large data sets that require SPSS or R or something like that. We usually work with Excel and Microsoft Word, so the programs that schools have available. We designed a data analysis course. One evening is all it takes for our teachers and school leaders to be able to do this. And then we go on to the interpretation and conclusion, and it simply means like the possible costs that we designed in step two, is our hypotheses rejected or accepted? And it's a little bit like a game, because if it's rejected, you have to go back to step two, and if it's accepted, you can continue with step seven. And just to give you a little bit of an idea how important it is to do such a cycle is, we looked at some data from previous data teams, and we saw that we had to reject 45 hypotheses. And this is a lot, especially if you take into account that the data coaches usually say, well, the first hypothesis that we are going to investigate, what is from the whole list the most likely one to be true? And still, in more than 90% of the cases, data teams have to reject the first hypothesis. There are a lot of assumptions in schools that are unfortunately incorrect. A nickname that our data teams have in the Netherlands is Mythbusters. I don't know if you know the show, but they do bust a lot of myths. If the hypothesis is accepted, we can continue with step seven, implementing improvement measures. So we develop action plans, we talk about who does what. And just to give you a couple of examples, um, you can see here all kinds of examples from more differentiation to formative assessment, uh, feedback. Uh, we just completed a study where we looked at our most successful data teams and the actions that they usually took when it considered uh, a student achievement uh, problem. It was a combination of changes in the assessments, often more form formative, less summative, 
quality of instruction, more adaptive teaching, differentiation, and curriculum coherence over the years. So these are usually actions that are really important. So then the final step. Usually our teachers and school leaders say at step seven, we're done. We've implemented our action plan, now we're done. However, evaluation is very important because we need to evaluate how our mesh is going and also we need to evaluate uh, if we achieve our goal. And the process evaluation is also very important because sometimes the actions that we take do not have the desired effects or sometimes they are not implemented by everyone, as you can see here on the screen. So that process evaluation is also very important. And this doesn't have to be very complicated or big. In the example that you see here on the screen, the mathematics teachers just had a conversation with a couple of their students how they liked the actions. And the, stu the students hated them. So then they had to adjust the actions. And of course, we want to know if the problem has been solved. We set a goal in step one, and we are going to check if we've reached our goal. So we've been doing this for 15 years, so that means we've also conducted a lot of research uh, into data teams. We have a lot of people that have gotten their PhDs based on data teams. Uh, I could talk, I think, for days on all of the studies that we've did, but I'm just going to uh, talk about two studies uh, in the final two minutes that I have. So the data team functioning, what we found is that it's very difficult to formulate a measurable hypothesis. Like I said, it's very easy to blame it on policy or on the parents or on the previous school even, but to make it measurable is difficult. We also need several round of hypotheses in every data team that we've coached. That's partly because there are a lot of uh, assumptions that are false, but it's also partly because education and learning is complex. So usually when we are working on a problem, a problem has multiple causes that need to be addressed. Those first hypotheses are often wrong, but they're very important because it's sometimes a little bit scary to work with data. And to link those data to your own functioning as a teacher or a school leader, that requires trust. So if you start with more external hypotheses, you can work on building that trust. You practice with the eight steps and with your data literacy. And learning starts when you make a mistake. Can you imagine what happens in a data team when you have eight people that all say, this hypothesis is really true, and then they find out it's wrong? So it's a really uh, a learning experience, and it shows the importance of data. What we also see is that slowly most teams go from external attribution to internal attribution. I think our most studied hypothesis is when we have a problem in higher education, blame it on secondary education. Secondary education blames it on primary education. Primary education blames it on kindergarten. We study it. It's almost never true, but we slowly go from those external hypotheses to, okay, what can I as a school leader, what can I as a teacher do to solve this problem? And if you do this, then we also find positive effects. We've studied this extensively, uh, and we found several positive effects of working in data teams. Uh, we found, this is very scary because we always administer an actual data literacy assessment to our teachers and school leaders. Uh, we found positive results there. We see a more culture of data use, more collaboration, more data use for instruction. I think uh, somebody mentioned it this morning as well. We have to get it into the classroom. And a majority of the schools solved their problem. Of course, some data teams, I have to acknowledge, did not solve their problem or did not work out. We studied that as well. I would be happy to share the papers with you, but I am going to finalize with this quote for a paper that I wrote with Ellen Mendinek by identifying shared goals and engaging in a collaborative and dialogic use of multiple sources of data in a professional learning community, teachers, school leaders, and students can make more informed decision. This will lead to a higher quality of education. Thank you for your attention.